So our, our final session for the day is a panel session which I will facilitate. And you can see on the screen that Anna is going to is continuing to join us for this session. I've also got our state building surveyor for the first time today at the conference. Welcome to Andrew, who most of you know. Uh, we've got Trevor Piscotto, which most of you know as well. He's the executive director in the building um, in the building section of DELP and the ED that is responsible for advising the government on building. Uh, plumbing and architecture policy development and regulation. And we also have today Professor George Zelanti. Um, Professor Zelanti is a retired uh, head of the School of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Adelaide. He has a multidisciplinary background, including in building surveying, but also architecture, and a lot of his experience as well as in, um, in management and leadership. Um, Professor Zulanti will be running one of the workshop sessions tomorrow as well, which has been heavily subscribed, so you'll be able to engage with him also tomorrow. So the panel session today uh, really uh, is a segue from Anna's presentation where I'm going to accept the views of our very esteemed panel on the future models for building surveying, which the Building System Review Panel is looking at closely as part of the discussion paper that will be coming forward over the next couple of weeks. And as you know, uh, private certification or private building surveying uh, began in Victoria back in the mid-90s. It is now the case that in seven of Australia's eight jurisdictions, consumers can apply to private building surveyors for their building approval, uh, with WA being the only jurisdiction where you remain um, with only the option of local government. Many say that this shift has contributed to the systemic failures that have undermined confidence in the industry, but many also point out that uh, the local government building survey model was replaced because it, it wasn't working. Um, and they say that the allegations around conflict of interest can apply equally in local government as they do to the private surveying systems. So um, it, uh, others say that uh, if there's been a fault in private surveying, the blame uh, should rest with the regulators who haven't properly oversight the system and who have allowed a race to the bottom. So with all of that in mind, um, I'm keen to hear from you, Anna, You've spoken in your presentation about the heavy engagement that you've had with industry in consulting about uh, the matters that will be in the discussion paper that will inform the ultimate recommendations of the panel. What has been the mood of stakeholders that you've spoken to on the need to change the current model for building surveying and, and how radical are the stakeholders calling for the change to be? Um. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, that's a very real issue and one that gets a lot of attention in our discussion paper and has had a lot of attention in our discussions with stakeholders. Interestingly, not one stakeholder we have met has said that there doesn't need to be change in this particular aspect of industry and practitioner standards and regulation. So I think there is a broad consensus that we need to make change. Um, the, as I mentioned in my presentation, the building, the, rel the relevant building surveyor groups have put forward their own models. Um, they have some commonality in them. Um, they, they all involve a greater certification, a greater scrutiny of private building surveyors. Uh, but they're also based fundamentally on improving standards across the whole practitioner um, cohort. And I think that's really important. But one of the things that I found really interesting about the uh, practitioner groups and their attitude to this, Bronwyn, is um, probably best summarised by Wayne Liddy. Uh, and I, I was watching a, a, um, a VBA uh, YouTube uh, discussion that you facilitated, Bronwyn, funnily enough, um, about the code of conduct for building surveyors. And Wayne said something along the lines of, 
you know, at the end of the day, the building surveyors have got to own some of the problems in the industry and move forward. And I think that is a fair summation of where, where most of the building surveyors that I've met are coming from. They know that there needs to be change. They, they, they shouldn't accept all of the blame for everything that's gone wrong. I mean, there's been, there's lots of, there's lots of factors in the system that have contributed to that. And essentially some of those things I outlined in my presentation about the regulatory framework not keeping up with the changes in the construction industry, the, the changes in the style of construction, in the types of construction and so on. I think that's been a big factor. Um, but I think it's refreshing to see that industry leaders like Wayne and, and many others um, representing other parts of the building surveyor industry uh, are willing to see, are willing to recommend uh, major and significant change. And so in a few short weeks, you will see that. And I'm really looking forward to having those discussions with practitioners, uh, Bronwyn, and with industry as a whole. Trevor, can I bring you into the discussion here? Um, you, as I mentioned in the opening, uh, this building surveying model that we've had in Victoria was introduced in the mid 90s um, and it was followed in a lot of other jurisdictions. Do you think that um, the policymakers got that wrong because it was, was taken up right across the country as part of policy reform? And are there features of the current system that we should try to keep? Uh, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, look, uh, I don't know why I'd go so far as to say the policy makers uh, have got it wrong. Um, and maybe that's me thinking about the fact that in 25 years, someone might look back at uh, the work that I've been involved in, and I'd like to think they're a little bit charitable about that. Um, I think, you know, we need to look at these decisions in context. And um, I remember a couple of years ago at the first uh, Building Surveyors Conference being on a panel with Graham Samuel and John Merritt and Matt Vincent and talking about the overarching trends in regulation that were kind of dominant at the time. And that was a trend towards kind of deregulation and, and privatisation. And so building surveying and the building system wasn't on its own in, in making that uh, move. And I think it was well-intentioned with a view to increasing competition um, and economic activity and allowing for innovation. Um, but what I do think is, and, and Anna touched on some of this in uh, both her presentation um, and, a, and her answer there is it's clear that the system isn't working as intended and it's having a lot of uh, unintended consequences both for industry but also really significantly for consumers. Um, but, but again, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and we don't want to pretend that there's nothing good about the current system. I think um, probably most significantly there's things like, um, you know, expert involvement in design, um, uh, at the start of the process, um, uh, the role of a professional like the building surveyor in verifying compliance, both the compliance of the design and then through mandatory inspections uh, along the way. Um, and then I think obviously the use of performance, which has been a real innovation uh, in the building system, um, has led to a lot of innovation uh, and enabled economic growth. But it's about how do we do all of those things better without some of the negative uh, kind of consequences that we've seen um, through uh, the, the level of non-compliance and defects that unfortunately exists. Trevor, given the timing, um, I, I'm, I'm going to bring Andrew and George in in a moment, but what I'm going to do first is um, try to get a bit interactive with this panel session. So I'm about to share my screen and what we've done in preparation for today's session is throw up six potential features that could be introduced in the reforms for the model for building surveying in Victoria. So you can see a slide now up on the screen and next to me, but you can also see hopefully a polling feature that has come up that where you can choose from this list of six potential features that might be incorporated into reforms the two that you favour the most. So we've got the cab rank, we've got moving it back to local government is option two. Um, and these are not mutually exclusive options, as you can see. Um, it is possible to uh, select more than two features, but we're really interested to hear from you, um, the audience, which of these two features resonate with you in terms of potential reforms. So whilst you're filling out the polling, I'm going to ask the panellists 
um, to provide their comments on these potential features for reforms. And I'm going to start with you, um, Andrew, our State Building Surveyor. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, so in relation to these um, particular items, um, it is a tough one because they're, they're little pieces of a puzzle, I suppose, and um, it probably does depend a lot as to um, how they're implemented, what the details are in, in each of them. But um, I think out of these ones that we've got here, um, my favourites are um, improving the checks in the process. Um, I favour improved checks that um, um, give us... Or, or I suppose the feedback I get is that we have a subset of um, building surveyors who, who do not, don't use their discretion well. And uh, ideally, our system relies on a core framework with uh, builders, building surveyors applying discretion for those items that uh, invariably fall outside of that framework. Um, so it's difficult to cater for everything within, within a framework. There's always an exception to the rule, and that's where discretion uh, is keen. Um, but the frustrated feedback I get from, from some in the industry is that there are building surveyors that um, use their discretion as a competitive advantage. Um, if they don't apply the discretion for an additional inspection or a third party review, um, they save the applicants uh, money and, um, and that becomes a driver rather than public safety, which is, is the really important thing that building surveyors should be considering is that all their decisions should be um, considering public safety at the at the core, um, and I think the code of conduct will play a role in this in, in helping bring that focus back. Um, I think uh, we need to have that public safety to be the the driver and not the checkbook. Um, and I, I think with improved in education and guidance, uh, that will also improve the application of discretion. But uh, in the short term, there's also likely to be a need for more mandatory requirements to ensure minimum standards are, are achieved. And, and that's where it becomes difficult with a mandatory that you can't cover all um, variations of the theme. So um, I think uh, it is providing more, more checks, more peer reviews, more um, inspections and auditing that um, reviews um, the, the areas where discretion should be applied and, um, and providing guidance to the industry as to what's, what's appropriate for the, that, um, that guidance. Um, Are there any others in that list that, that you favour or is there one in there that you would say um, really you're less, less likely to favour? Yeah, I suppose, um, you know, the, this probably is, is difficult to actually pick ones that are, are at one end or the other. I think they've all got their pros and cons. Um, moving parts back to the council, I think, um, uh, you know, I think one thing that's always concerned me is that, yes, there are some perceived conflicts within the private system. Uh, obviously, that's a driver of um, some of the, the discussions around how do we um, better manage that. And I think a lot of the, the uh, things that we're bringing into the system through all the reviews that are happening at the moment will uh, be steps towards that. Um, and um, I think that um, the thing that I struggle with most is the uh, requirement for privates to actually undertake the enforcement. So I think um, there's obviously conflicts uh, at that design and um, approval stage for the building documentation. But once you get into inspections, the pressures increase even more where you're, you've got a builder and a, an owner or a developer that's um, working to a schedule. Um, that changes on site are going to cost uh, time and money potentially and so that's where that real pressure can be um, sort of brought to bear on a, um, on a private surveyor. Thanks Andrew. So whilst we're still discussing the six options that you can see on your screen please uh, put your views into the poll of which two that you think are, are most favoured. Um, George, I'd like to bring you in. You have some very broad and uh, deep experience in building surveying and in looking at models across the country. Um, looking at these six potential features of a reformed regime, what, what comments do you have? Um, thank you, Bromley. I think from my perspective that there are two there that stand out for me, but one I'd like to have, offer a variation. It's four, I think, uh, and unless I misunderstood what was written, um, but you're, you're moving the approval system back to local government. 
I think that uh, what I would do and what certainly I've, I've been very much aware of in recent years is that I have no issue at all with uh, private sector doing approvals and no issue at all with local government doing approvals. My concern has been that I think private certifiers and private practitioners really struggle with the inspection side. And the, conf the issue of uh, community interest often gets lost in that. So I think that a variation that I would propose is that 4A, if you like, that perhaps um, some parts of the system go back to local government. That is, they can still do approvals and they, they, must, do the, uh, they must do the inspections. The private sector can do the approvals uh, as well, but they don't necessarily do the inspections. And I think that there is, that is a better control of the end product, which looks after the community interest. The other part that I do uh, like is the section dealing with better checks and balances in the system. I think that will actually go a long way to actually supporting the system. But so to answer your question directly, I think 4A, not 4, 4A plus, I think the other one, I can't remember what the other one number was, but they're the that two that I would favour. Improving the checks and balances, which is also right. proving positive in the poll. Um, I think that, that, yeah, that, that means that um, people can stand back a bit and local government, which who I think is in the best position to actually act independently, much more so than a private person who's being paid by a client, um, is in a better position to do the inspection. Thanks, George. Trevor? Uh, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, I think, um, yeah, look, uh, like Andrew, they've all got merit and they've all got pros and cons. I think number five, appointing an expert on high-risk projects is a really interesting one that warrants uh, some investigation. And more broadly, um, I think it links to something that Anna was saying around um, taking a bit more of a kind of graduated risk-based approach to, um, to the oversight of building activity. Um, you know, at the moment we have more or less a one-size-fits-all system. You know, we've got five, you know, issue a building permit, five mandatory inspection stages. And obviously there's a whole lot of discretion in there for building surveyors involved and, and the like, but still it, it's kind of the same process. Whereas I think what Five's getting at is, you know, one particular intervention around um, a, a particularly uh, high, um, you know, high quali highly qualified expert involvement appointed by um, the state, either local or, um, or state government for particular high risk um, projects. And I think that's, um, something that where the risk is very high does warrant examination. But then there's kind of lesser graduations of intervention that you might look at for lower risk projects and then all the way down to, to the lowest risk. And I think that's a kind of approach to the regulatory framework that warrants further investigation. Yeah, and if you look at option five as uh, appointing an expert, um, presumably that type of model would be that you would still potentially have private surveyors issuing a permit and doing inspections and so forth, but there'd be another person appointed over the top of that um, on behalf of government to oversee the process. Whereas if you look at option three, um, this is more where you say that there is still a risk assessment that goes on, but then certain buildings, uh, building risk types, you would only be able to get your permit from either local or state government and who would then be in charge of the whole process. So, can you comment on the difference between, I guess, the features in three and five in terms of, um, you know, how how those might be uh, a greater benefit or the difference in terms of how to implement those two options? Yeah, thanks. So I think you're probably right, Ron, that um, number five uh, could more easily be seen as a bit of a bolt-on to the current system. So you could have... Uh, things continue much as they are in terms of the issuing of permits and inspections being conducted by private building surveyors, but with an additional check for high-risk projects uh, that, um, that comes from the state and with some kind of authority behind that so that if there were issues that arose, uh, um, you know, there would be some force to the, the findings of the expert or an appropriate escalation pathway or, or so on. Um, I think... Three is, as you say, more of the um, different approach for differing buildings. I think, you know, there's a couple of factors that would weigh in considering uh, which way to go. I mean, one is that um, potentially five is less of a significant change to the current system. And I think um, every, every kind of 
policy person knows that the greater the change, the harder the implementation challenge. And uh, certainly the government's very aware of the um, incredible challenges that the industry's faced um, over 2020. Um, and so that will be one factor, I think, that will weigh into consideration. That being said, the, the other, I mean, the other way to think about it is to look at, at the heart, what are the, what are the, th what are the problems we're trying to overcome? And if one of those problems, a number of other speakers have mentioned the kind of conflict of interest that is potentially inherent in the private building surveyor model where, um, uh, and, and George just touched on this, um, where the person responsible for regulat regulatory decision-making is also um, being paid either directly or indirectly um, by the person they're regulating. Um, if that's the kind of inherent problem you're trying to overcome, then three presents a mechanism by which you try to kind of separate out that conflict for certain uh, types or, um, or categories of, of buildings based on their risk. So I think it's, you know, weighing up some of those different considerations that will come into thinking about um, both where do we want to get to um, and uh, what's a reasonable level of change that, um, that, that could be implemented. All right, thanks, Trevor. I'm going to close the poll now and uh, show you the results. And so I'll um, stop sharing and let's see what you, the audience, have said. Um, I'm not sure what you can see there, but I can see the poll results. And what they're telling me is that the majority or 40% of you chose option six, improving checks in the process as one of the options or features that you would favour in a reformed system. And then coming in second, um, and it's, it's fairly evenly split, about 20.8 versus 21.1%. Oh, numbers are still changing. In fact, both at 21% are options four and five. So either moving parts of the process back to councils to perform. So we would, this would, uh, I guess the idea would be that and still have a permit issued by local government or private surveyors, but once the permit's issued, then the inspections would be done by local government, perhaps um, outsourced to the private sector, um, and the issuing of the occupancy permit, and option five being the appointment of an expert, which is more, as Trevor describes, a bolt-on to, um, to the process. So they uh, seem to be the three favoured, not too many votes for the other three, which is um, around uh, having exclusive issuing to state or local government for certain types of buildings, moving it all back to local government. And the uh, least favourite option there is the cab rank, which is consistent with some of the consultation that's been done in other, um, other jurisdictions, I might say. Anna, I'd like to bring you in at this point um, and firstly ask, are these the sort of things that the panel is considering? And, and um, to the extent that you can comment on what the other panellists have said, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, uh, on potential bolt-ons or features for the system. Uh, thanks. I think it's fair to say the panel uh, is attracted to the idea of aligning risk with level of scrutiny, right? And so if you look at your option five, appointing an expert on high risk projects, uh, improving checks in the process also according to risk, um, and maybe moving part of the process back to councils as well. A greater involvement for MBS is definitely a role, a greater role for the SBS. That's definitely coming up on our radar, Andrew, so watch out. And um, certainly a graduated approach to risk. And I think that that was really highlighted in a point that Matt McDonald made that I was really sort of, it sort of blew me away a bit. It didn't surprise me, but the fact that he was able to get the, the statistics on it probably did. Um, when he said that um, there were $2.5 billion of defects across Australia as a result of non-compliance, and 1.5 billion of those were in class two buildings. 
Now, class two buildings is where we're seeing a lot of the, the shift in construction styles, right, away from uh, single dwellings uh, on big blocks into more de dense housing around uh, big cities in Australia. So we're seeing that risk get higher. We're obviously seeing a higher higher incident of defects. And that makes me think when you, when you look at that and, and mindful of the discussions we've had amongst the panel, I think it confirms um, the panel's view, I think, that it is sensible to go to a graduated risk approach. So in our paper that you'll see very shortly, um, you will see some options and some discussions of those. But this poll is very useful, Bronwyn. So um, I'm really glad that you were able to uh, get people to start thinking about these types of things. I'm sure they already have, but it's good to see the numbers there too. Um, obviously improving checks in the process, as far as I'm concerned, is a no-brainer. And then graduating your scrutiny according to the risk of the building or the project, I think is also a no-brainer. So I think, um, and I think it's fair to say the panel on the whole is, is uh, supportive of that approach. Thanks, Anna. I should say also that if you want to make comments in addition to just uh, choosing from those six potential features of a reformed system, um, please type those in. Anna has asked me to um, supply any further comments that you might make in relation to the discussion that she and her panel can think about. So um, please use the features that are there. Andrew, um, I'm keen to hear what you have to say about Anna's call out to the State Building Surveyor and the potential role that you might have. You're a very busy man at the moment doing what you do. Um, how do you feel about the prospect that you might be responsible for um, perhaps allocating experts or in some way managing uh, certain parts of the approvals process that could return back to state or local government? Yeah, I think there, there are some merits. So it's um, having someone that can actually have a look at some of these um, from an independent perspective and um, and be risk aligned so that um, I wouldn't want to be doing it for all, all projects right throughout the building system. But um, it is that tiering of approach where um, we can sort of rely at the lower end on the low risk ones, uh, less, less, less oversight, less um, review, um, more sort of in the middle. And then at the higher end, um, really trying to get that independence and that um, that third party sort of um, uh, operation working a lot lot better. Um, I think the pressures to increase local and state government role is obviously based on that lack of faith by some on the ability of private building surveyors uh, to independently perform their statutory role and, and any move back to local or state government would require considerable or considerable um, consideration of the um, resourcing transition that will be required out of that. And um, I think the move to private in the first place, as you mentioned, Bromham was really due to the um, our local government model not working efficiently. Um, and with the, the under-resourced system we actually have now, um, any, any, uh, any of the improvements will hopefully uh, shift the accountability from building surveyors to other professions. Um, and ease some of that resourcing pressures on building surveyors in the in the process. Um, so I think my preference is that we do take a progressive approach to this, um, where we're taking steps to to get to um, our end goals because of the transition in the resourcing. Um, and I think uh, that could include um, you know better auditing, better education, better reporting, uh, which results in stronger enforcement. Um, and I think if, if governments, um, local government's role was increased, um, this would need to come with a better system of reporting and monitoring to assist with the feedback. And, and um, uh, I think that's where the state building surveyor could have a, a role in really assisting councils with that reporting function, uh, looking at uh, how we can implement that across and, and monitor it. Um, so I think it's it, it will be a challenge because I think uh, all the councils are different. So they, it's the thing that I've um, really noticed it when I've uh, looked at local government is that um, you'll sort of pick out a particular problem and uh, define a solution, but then find that that might only work for a few councils. And then a whole lot of other councils are different. So that's, um, uh, I think, sort of something that... Uh, would be a benefit for the central body to sort of have a look at and uh, really put some structure around how councils 
um, should be operating their building control functions and, um, and how we can um, improve the resourcing for those building control functions. Yeah, and, and no doubt, Andrew, the, um, the, the the problems and tasks involved in the statewide cladding audit has already given you lots of opportunity as the BBA to engage and coordinate the response of councils. So there's probably plenty of learnings from that process. George, could I bring you back into this? Because it seems there's a consensus around taking a risk-based approach based on the types of buildings. And I guess in my mind, um, and we tend to sort of go automatically to different classes of buildings that might reflect risk. And, you know, perhaps when we think about lower risk buildings, we might be talking about class ones and tens. And when we think about complex buildings, we might be talking about 50 storey residential buildings um, that are perhaps done by some of our better performing builders in the sector. So do you have uh, any comments to make on, on how we might um, tease apart our understanding of risk and, and properly and um, in a considered way be able to ensure that we target the right parts of the sector for this increased scrutiny or for increased involvement of government in the process? Sorry about that, I keep turning my micro microphone off. Um, I, th I think the issue of risk is a good one. I, I'm a little bit apprehensive, uh, having been in the industry a long, long time. I've heard the word risk mentioned many, many times, risk-based analysis, risk-based based approach. Uh, inevitably, when something goes wrong, that all goes out the window. So that doesn't say it mean it doesn't necessarily work. Uh, my, my, my view is that, yes, we can look at that, but I think we have to look more closely at the relationships of the players within the actual industry itself. And the example is... Uh, building surveyors themselves and the relationship they have, say, with, with government is one example there. Um, I've always seen that building surveyors should be working hand in hand, hand in glove with government in, in a partnership type arrangement. And if, they, if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, um, government has no obligation, uh, has an obligation, no other choice, if you like, but to step in and, and rectify the problem. So with that, that in mind, I, 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 th I have some concerns about that because who, who runs the risk? Who has, uh, ascertains that what the risk actually is? Um, and I, I think there is a, a lack of unity in our industry. And I don't think we're actually addressing that. I think we're talking around it and I'm not being rude to anybody. The industry is fragmented, has been in my 40 years in this industry. Uh, and I've been, not, not necessarily, me, but we've all been saying this for many, many years. Um, so I have a real concern. I'm not saying don't do it, but I've heard this risk-based approach um, being used many, many times. And it, frankly, when things go wrong, it just does not work. So I have a concern with that. Um, education certainly will help, um, but I just think that we've got to go beyond just risk by itself. So, George, just following from that, um, you, you've said it's very important for the building surveyors to work hand in glove with the government. Yes. Um, how, 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 how do we achieve that when government has to both co-regulate with and regulate these private professionals, privately well, operating professionals? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I think that, you know, building surveyors have got, I think in Australia, two professional bodies that represent them. And I think those two professional bodies, A, should be working together instead of being in an in a adversarial type situation, as they sometimes are. I'm not saying they always are, but sometimes they are. Um, and they should actually be working hand in glove together to find out what the actual problems are and discussing those in a united way with government. And that, that would be a first in Australia, uh, because if you start to do that, you actually build goodwill. And if you know anything about talking to people, working in teams, working in groups. Once you actually trust each other and believe that you're there to do the right thing, you'll actually start to compromise, something that, which I think is actually left in our industry for many, many years. Um, and historically, I'd have to say the relationship between, say, industry and government has not always worked well. And it's very easy to lay the blame at one group, but I think you have to lay the blame at both. Uh, I, I've been around a long time and I've seen Governments flex their muscle, if you like, at different time because they're in a stronger power base. And I've also seen the professional bodies sometimes act more like unions rather than professional bodies. And I have a real problem with that. So I just think that uh, they've got to actually talk to one another. I think education is the key uh, to it. 
to actually making that happen. But there's got to be goodwill and you have to actually have people involved who actually want to make it happen. How you do that, I'm, certain, I'm not sure about that. If I knew, I could be, uh, do very, very well. But that is a concern that I have. <laughs> Say again. Bottle it if you knew. We'd all bottle it. If We'd we all bottle it. These balances are right. Um, I'm interested, Anna and Trevor, in, in your thoughts on the issue of risk, but also on the role of the industry associations and how, how, um, how well they're working in the engagement with, with, the, with the government. Uh, they, uh, well, in my experience in the last year since we've been, uh, we kicked off the panel review, uh, VBM, VMBSG and AIDS have been working incredibly constructively and, and the Municipal Association of Victoria. So I've seen a great cohesion of, uh, of views in many cases, and I've seen a great sharing of, uh, of, of the task. I think they and also a, 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 un, a unity in recognising, as I said before, that, that there is a problem and that they've all got a stake into it. I think coming back to George's point, though, um, risk-based in my mind is means that the higher the risk, the more that you put in the government scrutiny. So, and it may well be uh, MBS is at a certain level of, of building with a certain type of risk, and, and it may be ultimately the SBS for very high risks. And you may also uh, invoke peer reviews and independent reviews depending on the nature of the building. So I see risk-based approaches. I don't think of it just as the jargon of, of risk-based. And I know where George is coming from on that. It, it sort of irks me a bit too, but I'm, I'm trying to think of a practical way in which um, we don't say every single building, even very straightforward houses, single single story houses, have to be uh, scrutinised by a government person, whether they're from state or local government. But but we do recognise that that certain types of buildings have higher risk. We've seen consumers massively exposed because of this in the past. We've seen defects. Uh, we've seen huge numbers of disputes that clog up the system. And, and I think that what we really need to do is align the government responsibility and scrutiny with the risk more. So I, I think I agree with George, but I think we're coming at it in a slightly different way. Thanks, Anna. Um, we are now, I do have to close down the panel. I think you'd all agree we could continue to have this discussion long into the wee hours of the night. And I'm sure some of you do at times. I know I do in the work that I do with with uh, governments and industry. Um, but I'd like to thank the panel for their contribution today and for what I think has been a really interesting discussion. It's also given you some insights as to where the building system review panel is going. Um, Trevor's thoughts are also very relevant and important as um, an advisor to government from, from the department. So thank you for that. Now, I did say that I would return to some questions um, to finalise the session for today. And there are quite a few on here, but there was one in particular I wanted to uh, bring Corey back in if I could to answer. Um, so one question that has been put through the feed, what time frames could we expect to see in relation to more accessible and cost-effective insurance solutions for building surveyors and inspectors? Corey, are you still there? I am, Bronwyn, thanks for the question. So um, I, it's a really tough question and it, and it highlights the complexity of, uh, of all of these issues that we've been talking about today. So there, there isn't a specific time frame. From the insurance industry's perspective, it takes a view of looking at uh, all of the reforms that are going through, the changes that are going through, and then applying a lens of seeing the experience of how that plays out talking to those numbers earlier on and saying that uh, the industry last year, insurance industry paid $2.7 billion in PI claims alone. That's just PI claims. So when we talk defects and quantifying numbers, $2.7 million, billion dollars, sorry, which will go up, that experience is, uh, is getting worse. Put that into context that when the industry for PI insurance collected $2.4 billion, so before we've even paid our bills, we've paid more money in defects and issues for PI insurance than we haven't collected. So it's going to be a proposition where we need to get those uh, factors correct before we, uh, we see any real 
benefit coming out of, of that change. We need to go through the reform process and it's extremely complex and see the experience uh, of the improvement that those changes drive.